Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp, and this is Rich Gear, my co-host. I'm your co-host, co-host here, and uh, we are in part two of a, of a really fascinating interview with Dr. Raymond Demadian, who's the inventor, really, of the MRI. And uh, it's been so so good to have you. So okay, good. I just feel so Scott. blessed and honored to be able to mm-hmm. talk to you about this. But uh, in our last show, we kind of finished up a little bit. We started to talk about the beginnings uh, of uh, your how you actually built your first MRI machine. And um, before we get into that, we have a, 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 an associate of yours, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, do, uh, doctor, right? Dr. Yes. Larry, Larry Minkoff, who has actually you. been involved with you from the very beginning. Dr. Larry Minkoff. Yeah, why don't you come in here? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. And you're, he's a key. He's been a key component to your uh, to your endeavors over the years, I, as oh, I understand. Oh, that. absolutely. Yeah. The so first I'm, ever I'm, uh, scan of a human being. Was <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Although, as I understand it, it was it was try it was tr- supposed to be you, and you actually sat in in the thing. And what was your 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 partner, who the big yeah, guy? Yeah, no. Well, it was. It, it yeah, this this is this is a funny story. So you got to hear this. This is really good. Well, I like it. When we built the first scanner, which we gave the name Indomitable because everybody was ridiculing it, when we built the first scanner and we had it set up, the next thing, and we did it on test tubes and and so on to make sure it was working, the next thing we had to do was get a human being to go in there. And nobody would go in there. Uh, You know, there were all kinds of predictions about how it was dangerous and the magnetic fields and the aura fields and so on and so nobody would go in there. Well, well you need to explain that there was a mouse that got fried. <laughs> oh you <laughs> had to bring that up. Yeah there was a mouse that got fried so there was, there was a little, little, little Well bit. one might think it just make you a little bit more attractive. Yeah you know, I don't know. But <laughs> I, just, it's, in uh, your, it's in his book uh, folks it's in his book. Mm. De- details, details. details. So, uh, we might yeah. better mention his book, uh, uh, The Gifted Mind. This is uh, the reason for the interview is to promote his new book and uh, we didn't do that in the last show. Uh, well, we're, we say the best for last. It's a great book. It's a great read and it gets a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting stuff in there. So anyway, the point was you, you got talked into it or you volunteered or somehow you were the first one to put the thing on your well, but you, 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 you did thing. mention you made an important point, Rich, because it had never been done before. So you don't, you didn't really know, you didn't know. The, the details of what was going to happen. And you were right. We went ahead and did an experiment on a, on a test tube and <laughs> unwittingly fried the whole sample, you know, so uh, with, with the RF that was going in. So then naturally there were some uh, uncertainties about this. And uh, I finally agreed to get in, but I, I saw to it that when I got in, that I would have a cardiologist sitting there with me. <laughs> I was connected to EKG machines, uh, and I had all kinds of detectors around me just to be sure it was safe. And the only unfortunate thing is that all we got out of this first experiment was a normal EKG, mm-hmm. electrocardiogram. We got no NMR signal. And the, the signal naturally was what we needed to make damage, and we didn't get a signal. And we were we had spent all this time and energy and money, and we were really, I was very depressed about this, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, everybody had been ridiculing and, uh, from the, at the outset, saying it was absurd. And all of a sudden, Goldsmith, Dr. Goldsmith today, he was a, a, a graduate student who had built the coil, had the audacity to say, because he weighed 400 pounds, had the audacity to say <laughs> that I was too fat for his coil. <laughs> <laughs> and I was loading the impedance of his coil by being too fat. And as a result, that's why we were not getting a signal. And that eventually, when we were talking about this down the road, became the Goldsmith too fat hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, in the book, y- He's not a. He was a skinny guy back in the day. Okay, I, I've seen pictures of you. You were pretty thin back in those days. But uh, it wasn't that I was too fat. I was too fat for Goldsmith's coil. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. He needed and, a bigger and, coil. And, and I was loading his coil, and he could ma- he could not make the coil one millimeter bigger, and still get a signal. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So, what was your solution? So, the only alternative to <laughs> test the Goldsmith tube fat hypothesis was to get somebody skinnier. Hence, we have Larry. <laughs> 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 so, 
Well, at least uh, you ended up uh, not dying in the process, no, right? Yeah, that's right. I survived that first time, <laughs> except that we didn't get a scan. Mm, yeah. yeah. So the only alternative was to get somebody to test the two fat hypothesis. So what did you think about that, that you were getting volunteered about this thing? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than uh, just getting it to Goldsmith's coil, because I was working on an alternative technique of okay. my own. Oh. So why should I get it to his coil to get him? Oh, his technique. now something comes <laughs> out. Okay, his <laughs> technique finished. So anyway, Mike argued that finally he made the coil a little bit bigger, and I was having other issues. So okay, we decided to try me and Mike's coil. Okay, and uh, that's <coughs> and you were thin enough. So. <laughs> <laughs> That was Mike's but, observation. But, but there, there were there were key there were some key steps in the making of Indomitable, okay, mm -hmm. and we had to actually make this magnet that a magnet this big had never been built before right. like this, and the other big issue was the strength of the magnet is controlled by the amount of current electric current you can put into the coil. So just so we have an idea of it, when you, you you have household electricity, your household electricity has 100 amperes in it, 50 amperes, 150 amperes. And if I sat down and did the computer calculations, and there was one of our scientists, uh, fortunately at the time, Brookhaven National Laboratory was making magnets. And they said that I could borrow their software to calculate the magnet I wanted to calculate. Mm -hmm. So I got the software with a big a bunch of IBM cards, and then I calculated the magnet that we wanted to build to put a human being in. I wanted to get the strongest possible magnet because it would give me the strongest possible signal. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was the big uncertainty where we're going to be able to get enough of a signal. So when I calculated this magnet, now if I I realized very quickly if I use a special kind of wire that was not ordinary copper wire, instead of being li limited to 150 amperes of current, if I used a special kind of wire, I could put 1,000 amperes in. But it was a, a special set of circumstances. It was what we refer to as superconducting wire. Mm -hmm. And it's not made out of copper. What's it made out of? It's made out of the alloy niobium titanium. Okay. All right. Now, when you take that wire, niobium titanium instead of copper wire, mm -hmm. and you make it cold enough, which you do by sticking it in liquid helium. Wow. Okay. You can put a thousand amperes into it, whereas a copper wire you can only put 150 amperes into it. Okay. So I put six times as much current, I'll get six times as strong a magnet. All right. But now the problem was I'm going to have to make a vat that's big enough to hold liquid helium so I can put this wire in this liquid helium vat. And I'm going to have to be able to keep that liquid helium liquid. And helium don't like to be a liquid. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Helium yeah. likes to be a gas. Yeah. Yeah. And the way you get it to be a liquid is you go to ultra-cold temperatures, which are um, zero degrees Kelvin, which is 260 degrees below uh, zero degrees uh, uh, in your normal uh, yeah. s s Celsius. So I was going to have to go to minus 269 degrees and have to build an apparatus that would maintain that minus 269 degrees so that I could put this special wire in it and have it superconduct. And we were going to have to build all this thing. That's why we called it indomitable. So when I... But even getting the I wire was a problem, wasn't it? Huh? Even getting the, even getting the wire was a problem, oh, wasn't it? Well, no, it wasn't a problem well, getting the wire, but, but there were issues, okay? So I sat down and did the calculations with the, the computer program I got from Brookhaven. And the, my calculations for the kind of field strength that I want to call for 30 miles of wire, 150,000 feet. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh-oh, <coughs> we got a problem. 
And uh, what was the problem? Well, when I priced out the wire, it was a dollar a foot. So the wire was going to cost me $150,000, but all I had in my budget was $15,000. I had mm -hmm. one-tenth the amount of dollars that I needed. So I wasn't going to be able to do it. And I was hoping that, well, okay, I'll have to go out and, uh, you know, make some grant proposals and get some um, people to invest money in this project, etc., in order to get the R&D development funds to try to build this human magnet. Well, the, the magnet that I was envisioning with the 30 miles of wire, the wire doesn't come on one spool. It comes on multiple spools. Mm -hmm. And in order to make this work then, I was going to have to take one length of wire and then take another spool and join it, and take another spool and join it in order to get the 30 miles of wire. So one of the things I realized right away was when I made the joint, I had to be careful to, pres to preserve the superconductivity of the wire. Because when I made the joint, I could, in I could inject a resistance into that joint, right. and then I'd lose the superconductivity. Mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't be able to put a thousand amperes in. And so it would undo the whole thing. So I said, all right, well, I'm going to have to learn how to make those joints so that I can make those joints superconducting. So I said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll call my buddy, the sales engineer at Westinghouse that we had bought the smaller magnets from and ask him to teach me how to make the joints okay. until I can figure out how to get the money to buy the wire. So I called up, his name was Steve Lane. I said, Steve, I said, can you teach me how to make superconducting joints with the, Ni uh, the Niobe NVTI wire? that we get from you guys. He says, wait a minute, Domain. What are you doing? Are you going into competition with Westinghouse? <laughs> and you want me to teach you how to do that? I said, no, 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 Steve. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm trying to make a magnet big enough to put a human being into it so I can do an NMR scan of this live human being. So he says to me, oh, it's good. You're level with me, Domain. I'll share something with you that nobody knows. Westinghouse has decided to go out of business of making superconducting magnets, which they have been making for mm -hmm. 10 years. And I have about 30 miles of wire in my warehouse. I will let you have for 10 cents on a dollar. I couldn't, I couldn't believe what he was telling me. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. <laughs> At the very instant I need the wire, He's got it in his warehouse, and he will let me have it at 10 cents on a dollar. Exactly the money you had. I said, I, 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 I just couldn't believe what was happening. At the yeah. very instant, he's going to go out at the very instant. He's going to, not only is he going to let me have the wire, but he's going to go out of business <laughs> and let me have all his wire. He says, when, he said, uh, when would you like the wire, uh, Dr. Mann? So how about right now? He said, fine. He said, somebody, you got somebody send? Yeah. I said, I'll send Larry Minkoff. <laughs> 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 and, was a trip. And, Mike, and Mike Goldsmith. And they'll come out and get it right away. He says, okay, send them. So Larry and Mike Goldsmith went out to get the wire. And we brought the, they brought the wire back, and we built a magnet. And a few days later, my wife's mother and father are talking to me. And I said, boy, we had this extraordinary coincidence. She says, what are you talking about? I said, well, we were trying to build this magnet big enough to put a human being into. And when I sat down, Mom, to calculate the magnet, it's called for 30 miles of wire. It's going to call, cause $150,000. And I didn't have $150,000. So I decided to do something in between. And I called up Westinghouse. And Steve Lane of Westinghouse says, oh, well, we're going out of business. And I'll let you have the wire you need for 10 cents and a dollar. I said, I, I couldn't believe in that coincidence. And my mother-in-law says, that's not a coincidence. I said, what are you talking about, Mom? She said, ever since your father and I learned about you trying to build this magnet, we've been praying for it. This ain't mm -hmm. a coincidence. This is an answer to prayer. Yeah, so and it's, and, and it's a and miracle no of the wire. Yeah. There's for that. I mean, I mean I, 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 all the years since it's happened, I keep, I keep trying to explain myself how this could spontaneously happen at the very instant I need the wire and an exact amount of money. There, there, there's there's yeah. an exact amount of money. There's, there was no other explanation but his hand.
and, and it was his hand that uh, is something that uh, really changed the world in, in a lot of ways because of the uh, invention of the MRI. This started a whole new industry uh, and, and a new phase of uh, cancer research that probably never would have happened if uh, that would have taken place. Well, I, uh, just in a way of introducing it uh, to you, one of the wonderful things that the Lord's hand gave us on the MRI was another breakthrough that was part of the discovery that we didn't expect. My original thought was the signal that we make the image, the hydrogen signal, should be different in cancer tissue than in normal tissue. Mm -hmm. And that's the original measurements I made and showed that that was true. But what I didn't expect was that when I measured the other soft, when, in, in order to know that we had an abnormal cancer signal, I had to measure the normal. Right. And when I, so I made the same measurements on the normal tissue, and we measured on the soft tissues. We measured <coughs> the small intestine, we measured the kidney, we measured the liver, we measured the pancreas, and we measured the brain. And to my great surprise, the signal was different in all the soft tissues. Okay. So that the decay time of small intestine was 256 milliseconds, uh, and the decay time of brain, another soft tissue, was almost 600 milliseconds, is 595 milliseconds. And these are both healthy. These are healthy. These are healthy tissues, okay. healthy soft tissues. But there's another critical aspect. They're the vital organs of the body. They're the organs that make you live or die. They're the heart, they're the kidney, there's a spleen. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, um, we're experiencing a difference in the signals of 135%. Now the reason that's critical is that when I was an intern and a resident, you couldn't see the soft tissues of the body mm -hmm. on a medical image. No, no, yeah. You just couldn't see them. And the reason you couldn't was the, the way the x-ray technology works. The way the x-ray technology works is you stand and there's a, there's a cathode tube in front of you that puts x-ray through you and there's a piece of film in back of you and it, what it does right. is it exposes the film. Now as the x-ray is going through, if it goes through the brain and the heart at the same speed, then you get the same brightness on the picture and you can't distinguish mm -hmm. brain from kidney, from heart. They're all going to give you the same brightness. Mm -hmm. And if you ask a more s specific question, all right, when we make an image, we make an image uh, using dots. Mm -hmm. And a typical, a, a typical image has 65,000 of these dots. And these dots are equivalent to the black and white dots you have in a newspaper when you make a picture in a newspaper. Right, we call those pixels. So, and they're called pixels. They're called picture elements. Mm -hmm. And a typical MRI image has 65,000 of these picture elements or pixels. Now, if the pixels don't have a different brightness, your image is a blank. Because when you go and look at the pictures, they all have the same brightness. And your image is a blank. And that was the problem X-ray had. The differences in the brightness of the pixels mm -hmm. were maximum. 4%. But what we discovered when we were doing this, when I, when I was comparing the cancers to the normals, we found a big range of differences among the normal tissues. So liver uh, intestine had 253 and brain had 600 and the other vital organs were in between, which meant that we were going to get very different signals and the pixels were going to be very different. And therefore, when we made a picture of these 65,000 pixels, we were going to see detail in the vital organs of the body that were never possible before. Now also, once you've calibrated the normal tissues, then you can calibrate if bad tissue from those. From exactly. Those. Yes. Now, uh, now, is it the same? Look, I'm, I'm assuming, based on what you're telling me, that every brain has the decay rate is the same. And every, every... Well, uh, no, 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 well, I, I guess I'm very, I guess very close, you know, yeah. the, different, the difference from one brain tissue to the next is negligible. That's what I'm asking. So, right. so, so then you can calibrate if it's a cancer cell or something else that from one you know you, you, since you've got the measurements now of the normal tissues right. of all the things in the bodies now you can go out and calibrate all the ones for 
find out whether yeah. they got yeah, lesions exactly. or, or tumors or whatever else like that. You can you can right. see what so, it is. Okay. So we got a big we got a big difference in the yeah. decay time from disease tissue mm -hmm. than we got from normal tissue. Let me ask this question. This is kind of a really off. Maybe is anybody doing any research as why they think these decay rates are different in the different organs? Yes. I'm just curious what factor in the designer's purpose why they're that why it would be that I'm just you know just the thought process comes to my mind when you said that this is yeah the brain is different than the kidney I mean it makes sense they're different organs but is there a reason that we have been able to you've been able to maybe look into uh, medically or, or, or scientifically as to why that would help the function be better or worse or different than from one organ to the other. I, that's, I'm just curious. It's more. Yeah. All right. Well, it's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll start by, I'll start my explanation of that by asking you a question. When we're scanning the body, what molecule are we getting this signal from that we use to make the picture? Is it uh, water? Well, exactly. I would say, it's, I would say it's a water molecule. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we're getting it from water. Now, the thing is that remarkably in this context if I make if I look at the length of the signal coming from liquid water it's a thousand times longer or maybe than it is from the same water signal coming from ice okay so the signal is very very sensitive to the structure of the water molecule and the more uh -huh. liquid it is the longer the signal okay and the less liquid it is, the, you know, the, like in ice, like in a crystal, mm -hmm. the much shorter it is. So therefore, in answer to your question, each of these vital organs have a different composition of water one to the next. And the, so the decay time of the signal is different in all of them for that reason. Interesting. I didn't know it's, that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. It's the difference in water structure inside of these tissues that's giving you the difference in the signal. Interesting. That is fascinating. Yeah. How different is it in, in the body if it's all a uh, liquid form? I, maybe we're getting too little too esoteric and far afield, but I'm just... We were just discussing that before when you talked about the hydration shells around sodium and potassium. The okay. water in those hydration shells is different than liquid water. Okay. Oh, no, okay. But I, I think another way to say it, to explain yeah. it, is that that decay time changes with the freedom of the water molecule to move around. Yeah. Okay. Ah, if, okay. If the water molecule is free to move around, they have a long decay time. Ah. If the water molecule is locked and, and doesn't have freedom to move around, okay. then it's a short decay time. Yeah, okay. And so what we're basically saying is that the structure of the water itself on the inside of the tissue changes from one tissue to the next. And in one tissue, it has freedom to move around, like in the brain, whereas in the intestine, it has much less freedom to move around, so it decays much more. Interesting. Wow. And the critical thing is, of course, is that in a disease tissue like cancer, there's a couple of factors. When you look at the water content of disease tissue, it's as high as 90%. Hmm. Whereas the water content of healthy tissue is 67%. Oh, wow. So the net result is the cancer tissue has a lot more water and the water molecules a lot more freedom to move around. And as a result, mm -hmm. as a longer decay time. Longer decay time. Okay. Does, does that have anything to do with uh, uh, cells uh, lysing? Uh, you know, uh, they, when they die, they uh, release water? Uh, yeah, no, what will happen is that no, they'll fill up with water. Yeah. Because the other key aspect of this is the ability of the cell to const to Con contract itself, that the living cells have muscle proteins in them mm -hmm. called actinomycin, and they maintain a certain amount of contractivity. When a cell dies, the cell just relaxes and fills up with water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's Are you going to show us pictures about. here? Yeah. Well, wh one of the things that because we're able to see the vital organs of the body thanks to the MRI, and we're able to see the vital organs of the body in detail in the images, it has created another potential. That is, we can take a patient who has a disease like cancer, and we can monitor the success of the response to the treatment that's being used. Oh, yes. Okay. Is the treatment working, or isn't it working? Mm -hmm. And in, in a general way, <coughs> the MRI is not being used today to monitor the treatment. What I'm suggesting here is that the patient 
would start therapy and would come back for a scan every week. And is that cancer responding to the treatment or not? Right. And if you see that it's not responding, change the dose of the drug, change the kind of drug, and also take into account is everybody's a little different. Mm-hmm. What works for him may not work on you. Well, you so just a minute. Okay. So if you <laughs> if you set up a program where you can monitor the treatment, you're going to end up getting, I think, a better outcomes from mm-hmm. the treatment. Yeah, that's that's now, amazing. You have th- there's a real good question: Is what you're suggesting, Doctor Damadian, is that practical? I mean, can you scan somebody, Doctor Damadian, every week when it costs six hundred dollars to scan? And insurance I, companies aren't going to buy it. What? Well, insurance companies are going to buy it. No, low. but I think and we have an answer. Book, yeah. I think we have an answer that's going to make the insurance company happy instead of unhappy, and I'll explain. Okay. This is this is an example here of four images of a tumor uh, that a patient had. Uh, it was an ovarian cancer that had attached the colon, and you see here the tumor, the big white spot, and we have a measurement of how big it is in both diameters. And you can see that when we go to this first one before the treatment and down to the one after the treatment, yeah. that over a, cu- over a period, I think it's two or three months of treatment, the tumor went from that to that. A little beady. That. Yeah, a little, yeah. So, wow. so we can actually use the MRI to monitor the success of the treatment. That's now, what I was coming to is when we do the first scan, in, in the MRI we do different kinds of cuts. We mm-hmm. do a slice this way, that's called an axial cut. We do a slice this way, called a sagittal, and we do a slice this way, called a coronal. Now when I do the person, when I scan the patient the very first time I ever saw the patient, I have to make about a hundred slices because I don't know where the tumor is. And I don't know what T1 and T2 are going to give me the best image. But after I've done the patient the first time, I know exactly where the tumor is, and I know exactly which slice showed me the tumor. So now, if I want to go forward and monitor the treatment, all I have to do is repeat the same slice. And now Mm -hmm. I can repeat the slice in 10 minutes instead of an hour, and I can charge one-fifth of $600. I could charge $100, and I can do it every week on you, and see whether or not you're making this kind of progress. Yeah, that's from incredible. a tumor here yeah. to the tumor that you see here. That, so that, that, that's, that's exciting that, that, research. That's the new prospect we have, and also, like, uh, you can't see it very easily on this picture, but we have here the measurements of the size of the tumor in millimeters. So this patient on this this picture here, the diameter when is on the, before the treatment was started. The diameter, as shown in the measurements here, was 73 millimeters. Two months later, the same diameter is 15 millimeters instead of 73 wow. millimeters. So, mm-hmm. so, so we've been able to monitor here the effectiveness of the treatment in treating this patient's cancer. Wow. Well, Dr. Domenian, I'm going to, uh, we're going to have to bring this to a close here because... I didn't even get into all the other stuff. I, I know, on. but uh, I know, so much, so because uh, we're running out of time for, for this half-hour show. Yeah. Well, we'll see you next time on Revolution Against <laughs> Evolution.